Story nine of a changed man and other tales by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine. Master John Horsley, Knight. In the earliest and mustiest volume of the Havenpool marriage registers, said the thin faced gentleman, this entry may still be read by any one curious enough to decipher the crabbed handwriting of the date i took a copy of it when i was last there and it runs thus he had opened his pocket-book and now read aloud the extract afterwards handing round the book to us wherein we saw transcribed the following master john horsley knight of the parish of clifton was married to edith the wife late of john stocker merchant of havenpool the blank date of december be privilege given by our supreme head of the church of england king henry the eighth fifteen thirty nine now if you turn to the long and elaborate pedigree of the ancient family of the horsleys of clifton horsley you will find no mention whatever of this alliance notwithstanding the privilege given by the sovereign and head of the church the said sir john being therein chronicled as marrying at a date apparently earlier than the above the daughter and heiress of richard phelpson of montislope in nether wessex a lady who outlived him of which marriage there were issue two daughters and a son who succeeded him in his estates how are we to account for these as it would seem contemporaneous wives a strange local tradition only can help us and this can be briefly told one evening in the autumn of the year fifteen forty or fifteen forty one a young sailor whose christian name was roger but whose surname is not known landed at his native place of havenpool on the south wessex coast after a voyage in the newfoundland trade then newly sprung into existence he returned in the ship primrose with a cargo of train oil brought home from the newfoundland to quote from the town records of the date during his absence of two summers and a winter which made up the term of a newfoundland spell many unlooked-for changes had occurred within the quiet little seaport some of which closely affected roger the sailor at the time of his departure his only sister edith had become the bride of one stalker a respectable townsman and part owner of the brig in which roger had sailed and it was to the house of this couple his only relatives that the young man directed his steps on trying the door at key street he found it locked and then observed that the windows were boarded up inquiring of a bystander he learnt for the first time of the death of his brother-in-law though that event had taken place nearly eighteen months before and my sister edith asked roger she's married again as they do say and hath been so these twelve months i don't vouch for the truth of it though if she isn't she ought to be roger's face grew dark he was a man with a considerable reserve of strong passion and he asked his informant what he meant by speaking thus the man explained that shortly after the young woman's bereavement a stranger had come to the port he had seen her moping on the quay had been attracted by her youth and loneliness and in an extraordinarily brief wooing had completely fascinated her had carried her off and as was reported had married her though he had come by water he was supposed to live no very great distance off by land they were last heard of at oozwood in upper wessex at the house of one wall a timber merchant where he believed she still had a lodging though her husband if he were lawfully that much was but an occasional visitor to the place the stranger asked roger did you see him what manner of man was he i liked him not said the other he seemed of that kind that hath something to conceal, and as he walked with her he ever and anon turned his head and gazed behind him, as if he much feared an unwelcome pursuer. But faith, continued he, it may have been the man's anxiety only, yet I did not like him. Was he older than my sister? Roger asked ay much older from a dozen to a score of years older a man of some position maybe playing an amorous game for the pleasure of the hour who knoweth but that he have a wife already many have done the thing hereabouts of late 
having paid a visit to the graves of his relatives the sailor next day went along the straight road which then a lane now a highway conducted to the curious little inland town named by the havenpool man it is unnecessary to describe oozewood on the south avon it has a railway at the present day but thirty years of steam traffic past its precincts have hardly modified its original features surrounded by a sort of fresh-water lagoon dividing it from meadows and coppice its ancient thatch and timber houses have barely made way even in the front street for the ubiquitous modern brick and slate it neither increases nor diminishes in size it is difficult to say what the inhabitants find to do for though trades in woodware are still carried on there cannot be enough of this class of work nowadays to maintain all the householders the forests around having been so greatly thinned and curtailed at the time of this tradition the forests were dense artificers in wood abounded and the timber trade was brisk every house in the town without exception was of oak framework filled in with plaster and covered with thatch the chimney being the only brick portion of the structure inquiry soon brought roger the sailor to the door of wall the timber dealer referred to but it was some time before he was able to gain admission to the lodging of his sister the people having plainly received directions not to welcome strangers she was sitting in an upper room on one of the lathe-backed hollow-bottomed shepherd's chairs made on the spot then as to this day and as they were probably made there in the days of the heptarchy in her lap was an infant which she had been suckling though now it had fallen asleep so had the young mother herself for a few minutes under the drowsing effects of solitude hearing footsteps on the stairs she awoke started up with a glad cry and ran to the door opening which she met her brother on the threshold oh this is mary i didn't expect ye she said ah oh, roger i thought it was john her tones fell to disappointment the sailor kissed her looked at her sternly for a few moments and pointing to the infant said you mean the father of this yes my husband said edith i hope so he answered why roger i am married of a truth am i she cried shame upon ye if true if not true worse master stocker was an honest man and you should have respected his memory longer where is thy husband he comes often i thought it was he now our marriage has to be kept secret for a while it was done privily for certain reasons but we was married at church like honest folk afore god we were roger six months after poor stocker's death twas too soon said roger i was living in a house alone i had nowhere to go to you were far over sea in the newfound land and john took me and brought me here how often doth he come says roger again once or twice weekly says she i wish that'st waited till i returned dear edie he said it mid be you are a wife i hope so but if so why this mystery why this mean and cramped lodging in this lonely copse circled town of what standing is your husband and of where he is of gentle breeding his name is john i am not free to tell his family name he is said to be of london for safety's sake but he really lives in the county next adjoining this where in the next county i do not know he has preferred not to tell me that i may not have the secret forced from me to his and my hurt by bringing the marriage to the ears of his kinfolk and friends her brother's face flushed our people have been honest townsmen well reputed for long why should thou readily take such humbling from a sojourner of whom thou'st know nothing they remained in constrained converse till her quick ear caught a sound for which she might have been waiting a horse's footfall it is john said she this is his night saturday don't be frightened lest he should find me here said roger i am on the point of leaving i wish not to be a third party say nothing at all about my visit if it will incommode you so to do i will see thee before i go afloat again 
speaking thus he left the room and descending the staircase let himself out by the front door thinking he might obtain a glimpse of the approaching horseman but that traveller had in the meantime gone stealthily round to the back of the homestead, and peering along the pinion end of the house, Roger discerned him unbridling and haltering his horse with his own hands in the shed there. Roger retired to the neighbouring inn called the Black Lamb, and meditated. This mysterious method of approach determined him, after all, not to leave the place, till he had ascertained more definite facts of his sister's position, whether she were the deluded victim of the stranger, or the wife she obviously believed herself to be. Having eaten some supper, he left the inn, it being now about eleven o'clock. He first looked into the shed, and finding the horse still standing there, waited irresolutely near the door of his sister's lodging. Half an hour elapsed, and, while thinking he would climb into a loft hard by for a night's rest, there seemed to be a movement within the shutters of the sitting-room that his sister occupied. Roger hid himself behind a faggot-stand near the back door, rightly divining that his sister's visitor would emerge by the way he had entered. The door opened, and the candle she held in her hand lighted for a moment the stranger's form, showing it to be that of a tall and handsome personage about forty years of age, and apparently of a superior position in life. Edith was assisting him to cloak himself, which being done he took leave of her with a kiss and left the house. From the door she watched him bridle and saddle his horse, and having mounted and waved an adieu to her as she stood candle in hand, he turned out of the yard and rode away. The horse which bore him was, or seemed to be, a little lame, and Roger fancied from this that the rider's journey was not likely to be a long one. Being light of foot, he followed a pace, having no great difficulty on such a still night in keeping within earshot some few miles, the horseman pausing more than once. In this pursuit Roger discovered the rider to choose bridle paths and open commons in preference to any high road. The distance soon began to prove a more trying one than he had bargained for, and when out of breath and in some despair of being able to ascertain the man's identity, he perceived an ass standing in the starlight under a hayrick, from which the animal was helping itself to periodic mouthfuls. The story goes that Roger caught the ass, mounted, and again resumed the trail of the unconscious horseman, which feat may have been possible to a nautical young fellow, though one can hardly understand how a sailor would ride such an animal without bridle or saddle and strange to his hands, unless the creature were extraordinarily docile. This question, however, is immaterial. Suffice it to say that at dawn the following morning roger beheld his sister's lover or husband entering the gates of a large and well-timbered park on the southwestern verge of the white hart forest as it was then called now known to everybody as the vale of blackmoor thereupon the sailor discarded his steed and finding for himself an obscurer entrance to the same park a little further on he crossed the grass to reconnoitre he presently perceived amid the trees before him a mansion which new to himself was one of the best known in the county at that time of this fine manorial residence hardly a trace now remains but a manuscript dated some years later than the events we are regarding describes it in terms from which the imagination may construct a singularly clear and vivid picture this record presents it as consisting of a fair yellow freestone building, partly two and partly three stories, a fair hall and parlour, both wainscoted, a fair dining-room and withdrawing-room, and many good lodgings, a kitchen adjoining backward to one end of the dwelling-house, with a fair passage from it into the hall, parlour and dining-rooms, and cellars adjoining in the front of the house a square green court and a curious gatehouse with lodgings in it standing with the front of the house to the south in a larger outer court three stables a coach-house a large barn and a stable for oxen and kine and all houses necessary without the gatehouse paled in a large square green in which standeth a fair chapel of the south-east side of the green court towards the river a large garden 
of the southwest side of the green court is a large bowling green with flower mounted walks about it all walled about with a battled wall and set with all sorts of fruit and out of it into the fields there are large walks under many tall elms orderly planted then follows a description of the orchards and gardens the servants offices brew house bake house dairy pigeon houses and corn mill the river and its abundance of fish the warren the coppices the walks ending thus and all the country north of the house open champagne sandy fields very dry and pleasant for all kinds of recreation huntings and hawkings and profitable for tillage the house hath a large prospect east south and west over a very large and pleasant vale is seated from the good market towns of sheraton abbas three miles and ival a mile that plentifully yield all manner of provisions and within twelve miles of the south sea it was on the grass before this seductive and picturesque structure that the sailor stood at gaze under the elms in the dim dawn of sunday morning and saw to his surprise his sister's lover and horse vanish within the court of the building perplexed and weary roger slowly retreated more than ever convinced that something was wrong in his sister's position he crossed the bowling green to the avenue of elms and bent on further research was about to climb into one of these when looking below he saw a heap of hay apparently for horses or deer into this he crept and having eaten a crust of bread which he had hastily thrust into his pocket at the inn he curled up and fell asleep the hay forming a comfortable bed and quite covering him over he slept soundly and long and was awakened by the sound of a bell on peering from the hay he found the time had advanced to full day the sun was shining brightly the bell was that of the fair chapel on the green outside the gatehouse and it was calling to matins presently the priest crossed the green to a little side door in the chancel and then from the gateway of the mansion emerged the household the tall man whom roger had seen with his sister on the previous night on his arm being a portly dame and running beside the pair two little girls and a boy these all entered the chapel and the bell having ceased and the environs become clear the sailor crept out from his hiding he sauntered towards the chapel the opening words of the surface being audible within while standing by the porch he saw a belated servitor approaching from the kitchen court to attend the service also roger carelessly accosted him and asked as an idle wanderer the name of the family he had just seen cross over from the mansion odd zounds if you modden be a stranger here and very truth goodman that were sir john and his dame and his children elizabeth mary and john i be from foreign parts sir john what are you callin master john horsley knight who had a most as much land by inheritance of his mother's had he by his father and likewise some by his wife why bain't his arms three golden horses heads and in his lady the daughter of master richard phillipson of montislope in nether wessex known to us all it med be so and yet it may not however thit miss thy prayers for such an honest knight's welfare and i have to trape seaward many miles he went onward and as he walked continued saying to himself now to that poor wronged fool edie the fond thing i thought it twas too quick she was ever amorous what's to become of her god what how be i going to face her with the news and how be i to hold it from her to bring this disgrace on my father's honoured name a double-tongued knave he turned and shook his fist at the chapel and all in it and resumed his way perhaps it was owing to the perplexity of his mind that instead of returning by the direct road towards his sister's obscure lodging in the next county he followed the highway to casterbridge some fifteen miles off where he remained drinking hard all that afternoon and evening and where he lay that and two or three succeeding nights wandering thence along the anglebury road to some village that way and lying the friday night after at his native place of havenpool 
the sight of the familiar objects there seems to have stirred him anew to action and the next morning he was observed pursuing the way to Uswood that he had followed on the saturday previous reckoning no doubt that saturday night would as before be a time for finding sir john with his sister again he delayed to reach the place till just before sunset his sister was walking in the meadows at the foot of the garden with a nursemaid who carried the baby and she looked up pensively when he approached anxiety as to her position had already told upon her once rosy cheeks and lucid eyes but concern for herself and child was displaced for the moment by her regard of roger's worn and haggard face why you are sick roger you are tired where have you been these many days why not keep me company a bit my husband is much away and we have hardly spoke at all of dear father and of your voyage to the new land why did you go away so suddenly there is a spare chamber at my lodging come indoors he said we'll talk now talk a good deal as for him nodding to the child better heave him into the river better for him and you she forced a laugh as if she tried to see a good joke in the remark and they went silently indoors a miserable hole said roger looking round the room nay but tis very pretty not after what i've seen did he marry ye at church in orderly fashion he did sure at our church in havenpool but in a privy way ay because of his friends it was at night-time edie ye fond one for all that he's not thy husband thou art not his wife and the child is a bastard he hath a wife and children of his own rank and bearing his name and that's sir john horsley of clifton horsley and not plain jack as you think him and your lawful husband the sacrament of marriage is no safeguard nowadays the king's new-made headship of the church hath led men to practise these tricks lightly she had turned white that's not true roger she said you are in liquor my brother and you know not what you say your seafaring years have taught ye bad things edith i've seen them wife and family all how canst they were sitting in the gathered darkness and at that moment steps were heard without go out this way she said it is my husband he must not see thee in this mood get away till to-morrow roger as ye care for me she pushed her brother through a door leading to the back stairs and almost as soon as it was closed her visitor entered roger however did not retreat down the stairs he stood and looked through the bobbin hole if the visitor turned out to be sir john he had determined to confront him it was the night she had struck a light on his entry and he kissed the child and took edith tenderly by the shoulders looking into her face something's gone awry with my dear he said what is it what's the matter oh jack she cried i have heard such a fearsome rumour what doth it mean he who told me is my best friend he must be deceived but who deceived him and why jack i was just told that you had a wife living when you married me and have her still a wife um yes and children say no say no by god i have no lawful wife but you and as for children many or few they are all bastards save this one alone and that you be sir john horsley of clifton i mid be i have never said so to ee but sir john is known to have a lady and issue of her the knight looked down how did thy mind get filled with such as this he asked one of my kindred came a traitor why should he mar our life ah you said you had a brother at sea where is he now here came from close behind him and flinging open the door roger faced the intruder liar he said to call thyself her husband sir john fired up and made a rush at the sailor who seized him by the collar and in the wrestle they both fell roger under but in a few seconds he contrived to extricate his right arm and drawing from his belt a knife which he wore attached to a cord round his neck he opened it with his teeth and stuck it into the breast of sir john stretched above him 
Edith had, during these moments, run into the next room to place the child in safety, and when she came back the knight was relaxing his hold on Roger's throat. He rolled over upon his back and groaned. The only witness of the scene, save the three concerned, was the nursemaid, who had brought in the child on its father's arrival. She stated afterwards that nobody suspected Sir John had received his death wound, yet it was so, though he did not die for a long while, meaning thereby an hour or two, that Mistress Edith continually endeavoured to staunch the blood, calling her brother Roger a wretch, and ordering him to get himself gone, on which order he acted, after a gloomy pause, by opening the window and letting himself down by the sill to the ground. It was then that Sir John, in difficult accents, made his dying declaration to the nurse and Edith, and later the apothecary, which was to this purport that the dame Horsley, who passed as his wife at Clifton, and who had borne him three children, was in truth and deed, though unconsciously, the wife of another man. Sir John had married her several years before, in the face of the whole county, as the widow of one Decimus Strong, who had disappeared shortly after her union with him, having adventured to the north to join the revolt of the nobles, and on that revolt being quelled, retreated across the sea. Two years ago, having discovered this man to be still living in France, and not wishing to disturb the mind and happiness of her who believed herself his wife, yet wishing for legitimate issue, Sir John had informed the king of the facts, who had encouraged him to wed honestly, though secretly, the young merchant's widow at Havenpool, she being therefore his lawful wife, and she only that to avoid all scandal and hubbub he had proposed to let things remain as they were till fair opportunity should arise of making the true case known with least pain to all parties concerned but that having been thus suspected and attacked by his own brother-in-law his zest for such schemes and for all things had died out in him and he only wished to commend his soul to god that night while the owls were hooting from the forest that encircled the sleeping townlet and the south avon was gurgling through the wooden piles of the bridge sir john died there in the arms of his wife she concealed nothing of the cause of her husband's death save the subject of the quarrel which she felt it would be premature to announce just then and until proof of her status should be forthcoming but before a month had passed it happened to her inexpressible sorrow that the child of this clandestine union fell sick and died from that hour all interest in the name and fame of the horsleys forsook the younger of the twain who called themselves wives of sir john and being careless about her own fame she took no steps to assert her claims her legal position having indeed grown hateful to her in her horror at the tragedy and sir william burt the curate who had married her to her husband being an old man and feeble was not disinclined to leave the embers unstirred of such a fiery matter as this and to assist her in letting established things stand therefore edith retired with the nurse her only companion and friend to her native town where she lived in absolute obscurity till her death in middle age her brother was never seen again in england a strangely corroborative sequel to the story remains to be told shortly after the death of sir john horsley a soldier of fortune returned from the continent called on dame horsley the fictitious living in widowed state at clifton horsley and after a singularly brief courtship married her the tradition at havenpool and elsewhere has ever been that this man was already her husband decimus strong who remarried her for appearances sake only the illegitimate son of this lady by sir john succeeded to the estates and honours and his son after him there being nobody on the alert to investigate their pretensions 
little difference would it have made to the present generation however had there been such a one for the family in all its branches lawful and unlawful has been extinct these many score years the last representative but one being killed at the siege of Sherton castle while attacking in the service of the parliament and the other being outlawed later in the same century for a debt of ten pounds and dying in the county jail the mansion house and its appurtenances were as i have previously stated destroyed excepting one small wing which now forms part of a farmhouse and is visible as you pass along the railway from casterbridge to ival the outline of the old bowling green is also distinctly to be seen this then is the reason why the only lawful marriage of sir john as recorded in the obscure register at havenpool does not appear in the pedigree of the house of horsley spring eighteen ninety three end of story nine